Hi, and welcome to today's webinar, Driving Innovation and Partnerships at Edmunds.com. Our webinar will last approximately 25 to 30 minutes today, and it'll be followed by a brief Q&A. So if you have questions, please use the question window with your GoToMeeting console, and we'll queue those up to be uh, asked and answered at the end of the webinar. With that said, I'd like to introduce Ismail El-Sharif. He's the Director of Open Platforms for Edmunds.com, and his journey with APIs began at a Mashery BAPI conference in 2010. He's going to tell you a little bit about what's happened since then. Welcome, Ishmael. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everybody. Um, hope you're uh, having a good morning so far. So today I'm going to be talking about driving innovation and partnerships uh, at Edmunds.com using our API. So just a little brief about me. Um, I've been in web development for, for you know, 15, 16 years. Um, but over the past three years, I've been doing a lot of API development as well. Edmunds.com, let's talk a little bit about that for you. For those of you who do not know what Edmunds uh, does, basically we're a data, we're an automotive research company. We provide automotive data to consumers, and we put consumers in touch with dealers to kind of get the cars that they need. Uh, we've been online since 1995. We have three properties. Right now, we average 17 million unique visitors a month, and we make money by advertising on our site and actually submitting, putting uh, consumers in touch with dealers. So what Edmunds.com offers to people within the United States is automotive data. So that is um, pricing data, vehicle specs, marketing intelligence, um, incentives, rebates, maintenance records, and so forth, but also content, editorial content, photos, videos, uh, podcasts, um, and also social uh, products that we have, uh, ratings, reviews, comments, and so forth. We also have a bunch of tools that we, we offer um, to facilitate that process. Um, that Those include calculators and, uh, for example, a configurator, vehicle configurator. So at the heart of what we offer is data. Now, that just made it super easy for us to say, you know, if we offer data, we need to offer this data like on a larger level. And that's that's the reason why an API was always talked about. And we've been talking about APIs since 2007 or 2008. Um, what would it be, what, what would the world look like if our data is actually share, shared globally and openly with, with everyone else? And that was kind of a hard, um, a hard question to kind of think about or answer because we we didn't know how how interested people were were in our data. So what we did was um, we knew that we do not have all the creative and smart people in the world. We cannot possibly hire all of them. And we know that there's so much more potential to our data than what we can do with it. Kind of like what really made us decide that you know what. Having an API or having an API that will allow our, our data to be out there will uh, will will get us much more innovation uh, than what we're creating internally, and also would get our brand out there. Um, so we kind of formalized the answer to the question of why API by by focusing on three verticals. You know, we want to increase innovation, and we want to increase brand awareness and also monetize, uh, bring in a uh, different kind of monetization to, to the essence business, um, but not directly. We, do not, we didn't want to charge for the, for the data access at all. So right now, if you go to the, our API portal, which I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, you can use all our data sets for free. You, you know, we don't charge for any of it, but we still can, can monetize it indirectly by um, getting uh, data sets that we don't currently have from partners that are using our API and so forth. So we can we can we can think of and we do actually think of different partnerships paradigms based on people using our APIs. So when when we proposed that back in you know 2009 2000 early 2010, a lot of people thought that we're shooting ourselves in the foot. You know that um, our business is going to be cannibalized and um, that's the end of Edmunds, um, which is completely not true. Um, we knew that going out, going out in the wild and offering our data via an API is going to be risky, but also 
so we knew that um, there are companies out there that can help us mitigate that. For example, terms and terms of use and terms and conditions are critical in making sure that you're protecting yourself, but at the same time allowing uh, greater freedom for developers and your partners to use your data in, in creative, innovative ways. So we decided uh, at the time um, we talked to um, different companies. Apogee was one of them, um, Ashery and Freescale, um, and we really kind of narrowed down uh, our choice to, to two, to Apogee and Mashery. Uh, but the, the feature sets that, I, honestly, Mashery has offered and haven't talked to, to these guys uh, extensively, doing our due diligence uh, thoroughly, uh, we decided to go with them. Uh, and, you know, and we're very happy, actually, with, with that decision. So right now, you can find our API on developer.edmonds.com, and it will give you all the information you need. And you know, and when we decided to go public with our API, um, as I mentioned before, we didn't know how people are going to engage with it. Is there a demand for it out there? So what we did was we took our internal APIs and we made them public um, to just kind of test engagement. Is, are people going to use this thing? Yes or no? We just wanted to get quick answers uh, and then help us to help us kind of flesh out how we want to handle the API moving forward. Uh, the great news was that we got uh, major engagement, uh, and we kind of, in the beginning, we weren't ready for it, uh, but it, it sort of validated our uh, our assumption that APIs were, um, or our data was needed out there and people were really looking for, for it. it. Ismail, so, um, Ismail, what were some of the leading indicators that there was demand for your data, A, and that B, an API might be the way to meet it? Okay, great question, Michael. Um, people have been asking us a lot for our data, you know, some of our partners, before we launched uh, the API. And it's been very hectic for us to get that data over to them um, because we kind of have to put those uh, those data sets in a flat file or an Excel file and then upload them to an FTP server where the client can download them from. So we knew that there was some demand from specific clients in the marketplace, um, which kind of gave us the idea of, you know, why don't we just provide this data in a, in a this standard format so everybody can have access to it. But at the same time, we didn't know that the demand is going to be beyond those people or those partners. That's why it was an experiment for us to, to kind of gauge engagement. And once we opened the API, we've been getting, I mean, the first day when, when we launched the API is September 15th, 2011. We've got, we received like 20 uh, new registrations and like three people commented on the forums asking for, you know, help with, with, uh, with some of the methods that we had. So that engagement, that instant engagement kind of gave us an indication that, you know what, there's something here to be, uh, to, to consider and the APIs are, and all the APIs is, is uh, looks like it's going to do well. Uh, so that, those were the initial indicators that we had. So um, if you guys go to developer.essence.com, you'll be able to see all the data sets that we offer. We have um, you know, an array of vehicle-specific data sets, uh, like incentives, prices, dealer information, dealer ratings or reviews. We have vehicle photos available. We have a VIN decoder service that's also available via the API. We have, uh, and we also have um, um, kind of auxiliary uh, um, tools that can help you make sense of the API, if you will. We have an API console that we started building in the very beginning, but Mashery uh, released their own version of it, so and it's great, so we're using that. And that kind of allows you to interact with the data quickly to figure out what, what it does. Uh, we have a Chrome extension, a JavaScript SDK, obviously the docs um, kind of tell you what, what's going on with that. So we launched that nine months ago. So what happened in the past nine months? A lot, a lot happened. So um, when we started out, we started out with uh, a projection from Mashery. You know, they kind of told us what what makes sense or what is a healthy engagement or what is a healthy one-year performance for your API. So kind of took that as as a benchmark, and we started we started measuring the engagement uh, with the API on um, with, uh, within different milestones. You know, so the first 20 days, 26 days, we had 55% engagement, which is which is which is really big. So it's almost like one out of uh, two developers that register for our API actually engage with it, make calls, uh, make several calls, uh, or 
API calls and actually in active development. In uh, the first four months, uh, we saw the engagement went down a little bit, but still was it's still you know a lot better than uh, the 11 percent that Mashery told us was a good kind of indicator uh, uh, of engagement. And I think the uh, the reason behind that is our API is, is very specific and it's very uh, particular. Um, that only if you're interested in data, uh, automotive data, that you're going to register for it to begin with. So um, the engagement percentage between, uh, or the rate between people that actually register uh, and those who uh, who end up engaging is not um, is high because we don't get a lot of people that register just for the hell of it, you know. So, which is a good thing. So we don't have a whole lot of registrations, but we the engagement within those that register is very high. In nine months, um, as you can see, the number went back up. We have 53% engagement, which is great, and the number of live applications that are using our API has also increased, which is really awesome. Um, some of the highlights that we, we kind of learned um, uh, in the past nine months is that, obviously, you know, there are some concrete metrics like 63 million API calls have been made, which is, which is huge for us. It's huge, uh, but also we found that Having an API, an external API, allows our internal teams to innovate better and faster and to think, um, to think of our data in a completely different way. And uh, the reason behind that is, you know, when you're building a prototype and you're building a service, you want it to be exposed to the, you know, on, on like Heroku or you want to put it on an EC2 um, um, instance on Amazon. And that in the past, that was very hard to do because of the domain uh, restrictions that you had with APIs. You cannot, for example, do an AJAX call from a domain that sits, uh, from a page that sits on EC2 uh, with a different domain than Essence.com and make a call to our internal APIs, for example. So that wasn't possible. People had to build, you know, different services and, and deploy those services on, on these cloud instances and so forth. It was very com convoluted and hectic. But now with, with open APIs, those APIs are now available to anyone with a web page, allows for people to really think faster about innovation and actually prototype even faster, which, which was a really surprising uh, uh, learning that we have. And obviously high engagement, um, you know, people that do come on uh, our platform are highly engaged. And we have 80% of our data and content out there. And the reason I'm saying 80% is because the, the, the rest, the 20% that's left to be deployed, um, it just, it, there's a lot of work for us to get that data out there. Uh, and we're working on it right now. But it's, it's, it's all happening um, and it's happening fast. And as you can see here, engagement for um, people, the, the number of API calls started really slow because people, you know, were testing out the API, they, they were developing and so forth. But starting April, we saw a major increase when people started pushing their products live, and uh, which is really, really good to see. And uh, I just checked actually for June, and it looks like we're getting 30, 31 million uh, API calls, which is also good. Some of our API partners are um, listed uh, here in front of you. Uh, obviously, we have big companies, we have small companies, we have OEMs who are interested, um, we have startups, we have all sorts of people that are actually using our API today. And, and a very exciting example is Next Step. I want to show you what they did. Uh, Next Step is a dealer, um, uh, is, uh, is a, a development, a web development group uh, in, uh, in New York. They're based out of New York, and they serve about 300 dealerships in the Northeast. Uh, and what they did was they kind of found out about a, our API, and uh, without contacting any of us, any like without contacting anyone at Essence, they actually built a product based on our API, and they started selling it to the dealer dealerships that they uh, that they serviced. Uh, which was really interesting. Uh, interesting. Uh, they started obviously talking to us to um, later on um, to, to raise their quota, for example, so they can make more API calls and so forth. But when we looked at the solutions they uh, the solution they built, it was really really awesome. And we thought, 
they, they kind of uh, exemplify what people can do with our data and the API. And what they built was uh, a very simple solution where um, consumers on dealership, uh, on a dealer website, can actually look up the car and get the Edmunds True Market Value voucher, and, they can, they, and then they can print that out, and then they take it to the dealership to, to try to get a better deal. So um, Ismail, they, they discovered you entirely through your API, right? Yes, it, and absolutely. They found out about our API somehow. Uh, they started using it, and then they, they contacted us to raise their quota and to answer some of their technical questions uh, it, that they have. So is it, is it um, fair to say that, that the data they used could have been you or a competitor, but your, your sort of nimble position, the fact that you were out there with an API that was easy to consume, put you in the, in the full position for this? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, we are now in partnership with Next Step. I cannot go into the details of it, but we are able to get uh, and enhance our data as a result of this partnership. Uh, which is which is really good for us for Edmonds and obviously it's great for Next Step as well. So this is a, a, it's just a concrete example, and, and the reason I'm really excited about Next Step is that um, it, honestly their form and their product is performing so well, um, it's on par of uh, the performance that we have on our site. You know, in terms of like lead generation, which is awesome. Um, but at the same time, we're, we're getting something out of it. Obviously, our name is out there. Now everybody knows that this data is powered by Edmunds.com. But we're also, we're also getting new data sets that we never had before uh, from our partners, which is great. So our API strategy has always been to gauge interest. You know, From the very beginning, we didn't know what the interest was. So we took our internal API, put it out there, and and started measuring, started measuring how people engage with it if at all. So we, we gain in, uh, interest and we're pretty, we're not as fast as we, we like to think we are, but we, we like to be um, fast and smart in terms of what we address uh, from uh, the list of interests that we get back from our consumers. So what to fix first, what to provide uh, the consumers first. Um, that gets prioritized based on the list of interests that we gather from, um, from our consumers or developers who use the API. We measure the impact um, of, of the things that we de de um, deliver. For example, <clears throat> if we update uh, a method or we introduce a new service and the number of uh, complaints on the forum or on Twitter go down, that's, that's a positive impact. If they go up, that's a negative impact and so forth. And um, our strategy also is to create new value, right? Uh, and I mentioned that we have created new value uh, through our partnership with Next Step. And uh, let's just go through that again. You know, it's, it's basically your, our strategy cycle that we go through um, day in and day out. So um, the exciting thing is, uh, what's what's in store for 2012? I mean, 2012 is almost you know half halfway through, uh, but we are hoping that uh, the end of the world doesn't happen for us um, and we get the rest of uh, the year to work on what we want to do. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, in 2012, we really want to focus on widgets. Um, and the reason we want to focus on widgets is that, you know, not everybody that wants to use our data is savvy or technical enough to, to write code to consume that data through the API, right? Um, and you will notice if you think if you're thinking of putting uh, uh, or you know deploying an API anytime soon, you really need to start thinking about widgets because we get that those we I mean widgets are, is the number one requested feature from our consumers and our partners right now. Uh, and by the way, when I say consumers uh, in, in in the API context, I mean developers, right? So. It's the number one requested feature because even even big companies with big development uh, sh uh, department, they don't have the capacity or the bandwidth to actually spend time implementing code that extracts data from an API. So they want a plug and play solution that they can put out there, which is great. You know, so it it, it kind of uh, lends itself to faster adoption. But it's also good for us because uh, a widget by nature is a self-enclosed HTML snippet uh, that can embed some analytics about how automotive consumers interact with, with this piece of code, which is really good for us because it would give us more uh, insight into what the automotive consumers are doing. 
Uh, it will give us also more control of how uh, we enforce our terms of service. For example, we can have our logo um, part of the, the widget and we can make it clickable back to admins.com the way our terms of service uh, kind of dictate, um, give it, giving us uh, the attribution the attribution that we request. But also it's extens extendable. So um, people, um, developers can extend the widget with all the uh, the custom events that we built that we built into it, and they can actually uh, create more functionality uh, on top of it as well. So, for example, the biggest uh, request that we have in terms of widgets is calculators, right? As I mentioned before, we have all of these tools that are available on Atmos.com, but the calculators uh, are are huge, right? They're you know the the, the most famous or the most popular widgets that we have on the site, um, but right now they're only available on Adams.com and they're not uh, pluggable onto any other page. So we're focusing on getting the widgets up and running hopefully this year uh, so people can just drop them, uh, like you can, you can get Walmart, for example, dropping it on their website or Costco or uh, any other company like that without having to worry too much about uh, the development that goes behind that. So uh, widgets are important, but also the API uh, 2.0. We're uh, re-architecting how we do API, again, uh, since we just put out our internal API to begin with to, to gauge the interest out there, and now that we know that people are interested in our data and, 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 and using API, we really want to re-architect how that API works for external usage. So obviously we had tons and tons and tons of learnings over the past nine months, um, and all of that is going to be incorporated in the new uh, in the new REST API. And we also want to incorporate the right uh, capability. We want to be able to, uh, to capture data through the API and, and store that in our in our own databases. Because right now our API is uh, read only. Obviously, it goes without saying that the API has to be developer friendly. Which, you know, if you're a developer uh, who's used our API, it's not the friendliest API in the world in, in some respect. Um, you know, in terms of like the the payload that comes back to the server is a little too large for, you know, certain common use cases and so forth. So we're going to do our best to make sure that um, it's developer friendly. It's uh, it, it follows best practices and so forth. And, and all the learning that we got from, from you guys uh, will be incorporated in that. So with widgets and API 2.0 is um, on the roadmap, we're going to be pretty busy for the rest of the year trying to get that out the door. But um, that's been our experience with the API. Um, if you have any questions, you can find me on, on Twitter. You can always uh, tweet me your question, and I'll be happy to get back to you on that. So. Thanks for having me, Mashery, and uh, Thanks. I'll send it back to you. Thanks, Ismail. We, we do have a, a few questions from the crowd um, and, and a few minutes left to answer them, if, if you don't mind. Um, sure. So, so one of them is kind of a, it, it's a big question, um, actually a group of questions kind of uh, aimed at understanding the ease of deployment for the Mashery solution specifically um, and anything that you can say about, you know, ease of managing security and how agile the solution's been, and then specifically a question around, you know, how hard or difficult or easy is it to um, control business rules to create one-offs for individual partners who might need a different set of permissions? Okay, okay, perfect. So um, the first question is how easy the integration was. I got to say, um, and you know, Michael, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, I'm very, very skeptical when it comes to dealing with third-party companies, and I know there's always some problems that come up. I gotta say, the integration with Mastery went without a hitch. It took exactly 20 days, and I, I remember it happened in July. We started in July, it took 20 days between um, getting our um, getting our, the list of APIs uh, out there, uh, mapping, making the mapping happen, you know, mapping the, the proxy URL to um, to our, you know, original U, uh, API URLs, internal URLs, and also the Mastery folks spoke with our uh, apps, uh, um, our app ops guys, uh, to make sure that uh, they're whitelisted, certain domain uh, IP addresses are whitelisted, and so forth. Um, we we kind of handled all of those questions in 20 days without without 
going back and forth without having anything kind of fall through the cracks and, and it was perfect. The most of the integration or most of the time that I spent during the integration was in documenting the API and making sure um, that the mapping works correctly, but that's something that I had to do. Uh, the tools that Mashery offers were, were great um, and they made it super easy for me to, to do my job. And now the second the second part, what was it again, Michael? So specifically, you know, how, how um, hard or not is it to create one-offs for individual partners who might need different access rules? Okay, so uh, here's the thing. We had, um, from the very beginning, um, a, uh, a very clear uh, policy around one-offs. The reason we have APIs is not to have one-offs at all. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Edmonds business, but we have tried syndicating our data uh, around, I think, in 2005 or 2004, something like that. And we killed that initiative precisely because of the one-offs. Um, we built, we took the onus on us to build, to, uh, to build all these portals for third-party companies that feature our data, which is basically what, you know, what we're doing right now, but instead of building it, we're offering the raw data. So we used to build uh, these um, very custom-made um, portals and it ended up being a maintenance nightmare. We could not maintain that. And that was one of the learnings that we had from that experience and we vowed not, never to repeat it. So we try as much as possible not to do one-offs and we kind of put the onus on the, the, the partner or the developer to kind of you know work around the data uh, because this is the data set we're gonna offer. We can offer them a, a private API depending on the, on the relationship that we have with them um, that has extra amount of data, but we're not we're not having any business logic within the API that says if you're eBay you do this and if you're Honda you do that. We don't have we do not have any of that. Got it. Uh, but to answer your your question, um, David, you know while the Edmonds uh, there are some business decisions around Edmonds that is ha that has them not doing that. You know the the platform itself makes it really easy to change limits uh, for individual partners, keys, or applications. So it, it's, um, it's essentially UI driven. And if you want to talk some more uh, to detail on that, you can email us or email me at, at michael at mashery.com. Uh, we can show you how that's done. Uh, I think we have time yeah. for one more question. Oh, or go ahead. Actually, I just want to add that we do use, uh, we do give different partners different uh, quotas and different, uh, um, different key uh, privileges and so forth. Um, but in terms of the data sets that we offer them and business logic within our within, within our infrastructure, that does not exist. Got it. Um, so one more question uh, from from the audience, Ishmael. Um, they're wondering why you went with REST as opposed to SOAP or XML for your for your two O. Okay, great question. I think REST is is the future. SOAP has been used. Um, is an old standard. I mean, a, a lot of people still use it, but most of the development that happens today happens in the front end, right? Uh, with, with the advent of JavaScript, uh, with, uh, with Ajax and so forth, with JSONP uh, available to developers, a lot of, a lot of, lot of people, we know this ourselves, that most of our development happens in the browser. Um, and even when we do some, or at least the data parsing, and even when we do it in the back end, JSON, um, uh, and REST seem to be like the, the, the natural uh, protocol or the natural way that we call this data. So we, we thought instead of supporting all of these, um, um, you know, JSON, XML, and SOAP, and, and REST, and, and all of that, let, let's just focus on REST and JSON and, and just make sure that that is working for us. And um, so far, we only got one complaint about people not being able to use the, the API because it's in REST. I honestly can't think of a use case that you cannot use REST in uh, where SOAP is, you know, um, is the only solution that you, you, you have to have. Great. Well, that brings us to the top of the hour. We want to thank everybody for joining us and, and a special thanks again to Ismail for making yourself uh, available. Thank uh, you.